Schedule release days have become like a big business now. And after a slow schedule leak in the early part of this week, Carolina released their full 11-game non-conference schedule on Wednesday. And listen, there is not much wiggle room. Carolina is going to have to be ready to go right out of the gate. You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Thursday, August 10th, 2023. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and I want to thank you so much for joining us on today's episode, which, by the way, is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash college or enter promo code LockedOnCollege for a free white Bird Dogs tech hat with any purchase. You won't want to take off your Bird Dogs. We promise you. Coming up on the show today, we're going to unpack the schedule release. I've got several takeaways for you about that and we got to talk about the Devontae Walker debacle that is going on with the NCAA. We'll get to that in a little bit, but basketball schedule. Here's the thing. We're still like three months away from this thing tipping off for real with the regular season, but I'm like a kid in a candy shop right now. I just get so excited thinking about the matchups and, and the travel and how do you handle all of that, man. I just absolutely love it. So I want to talk through some things, some of the historicity of it, all of that. And then I've got some takeaways uh, for you, things that I like to pay attention to as I'm looking at a schedule. You might have some things that, that you're picking up on that maybe I didn't even see or that others haven't seen. Would love to hear your thoughts on that. So here it is, the full non-conference schedule, which we'll start with even before we get to the regular season, the exhibition game. There's just one. Remember, teams can either play uh, two exhibition games two secret scrimmages or one of each. Carolina typically in recent years has done one of each. So there's just one exhibition, uh, nothing we know yet about a secret scrimmage, but it will probably happen. So that exhibition game, it happens in October, folks. It's here before you know it. October 27th, that's a Friday night. Carolina will host St. Augustine's for an exhibition in the Smith Center. That'll be at 730. So there you go. Now, let me run you down the actual 11 games of the regular season non-conference part of the schedule. The first game comes on Monday, November 6th. Carolina will host Radford. That's right when things tipped off last year. It was like the seventh last year, I believe. So right in that same week, the first full week of November. So about six days later, well, on, on November 12th, Sunday after that, Carolina will host Lehigh. And then that next Friday, November 17th, Carolina will host UC Riverside. Um, I believe that is the first ever matchup between Carolina and UC Riverside. I've looked back through the record book and, and everywhere else. Um, Carolina has played Radford and Lehigh, but I do not believe UC Riverside before. Well, it's those three, and then, man, you hit the ground running, heading down to the Bahamas for Thanksgiving week, where Carolina plays three games. We've already talked about that earlier this week. Let me run us through it one more time just to make sure everyone caught that. Games will be Wednesday through Friday. You're guaranteed three. Carolina first will take on Northern Iowa. That'll be noon Eastern on ESPN. And then on Thanksgiving Day, they will either play Villanova or Texas Tech, just depending on what happens on Wednesday. And that will either be at noon or 5 p.m. Eastern on ESPN or ESPN2. And then on Friday, the potential opponents in the final game are Michigan, Memphis, Arkansas, and Stanford. And it'll happen sometime either 1, 3, 36, or 8, 30, and it'll be on one of the ESPN. So that's the battle for Atlantis Wednesday through Friday of Thanksgiving week. Then that next Wednesday, so uh, exactly a week after the battle for Atlantis tips off, Carolina will host Tennessee in the inaugural ACC-SEC Challenge. Remember, ACC Big Ten Challenge is no more. Why? Because the Big Ten does not have the ESPN networks in its new media rights deal, and that's who puts on these events. So no more ACC Big Ten Challenge. That one is going to be at 7.15 Eastern, again, on one of the ESPNs. 
And then Tuesday, December 5th, is the Jimmy V Classic at Madison Square Garden, second year in a row. Carolina will be there. This is another one that we already uh, had the finalized info earlier in the week. So, again, no need to really get too deep into it, but it's against reigning national champion UConn. It'll be the second game of a doubleheader in the Jimmy V Classic following Florida Atlantic and Illinois. That should be a great game, too. And then after that, there's 11 days until Carolina plays on December 16th. That's a Saturday in the CBS Sports Classic. That is the news we got on, when did that come out? Tuesday, I believe, was when that um, formal information came out. And the CBS Sports Classic this year will be in Atlanta at State Farm Arena. Carolina will be playing Kentucky at 5.30 on CBS and or Paramount plus whichever you prefer to watch. Now, I want to dive into this one a little deeper before we go through the rest of uh, the, the final um, couple games there of the non-conference schedule. Some of the reporting previously had suggested that Carolina would play UCLA in the CBS Sports Classic, which would make a ton of sense. But that's not what's happening. Instead, Carolina is scheduled to play Kentucky again, meaning that UCLA and Ohio State are going to face off. This means that Carolina and Kentucky have played now in four of the past six CBS Classics and five times out of the 10 overall that have happened. Now, to be fair, some of that is because of COVID stuff with other programs. It is what it is, but still. They didn't have to schedule in this year. All that said, though, no offense to Ohio State, no offense to UCLA. I would rather Carolina play Kentucky every year because it's two of the bluest, blueiest, bloodiest blue bloods of all time that are out there, Carolina and Kentucky. And so you always want to have that marquee game. But if you're going to have four teams in an event, you expect an even distribution amongst the games, right? So this is the 10th time Carolina has had the CBS Sports Classic. So you would think that Carolina had played previous in the previous nine, Kentucky three times, UCLA three times, and Ohio State three times. But that is not the case. Again, this is going to be the fifth matchup out of 10 against Kentucky. So um, here's the thing, though. Carolina out of all the teams has the most wins. The Tar Heels are six and three all time in the CBS sports classic. Um, but interestingly, they are only one in three against Kentucky in the first four matchups. So all three of their losses are against the Wildcats, but they've never lost to UCLA or Ohio state in the CBS sports classic. They are five and zero oh against those two schools. So interesting stuff with the CBS sports classic. Curious to see what happens going forward. And then the final two games of the non-conference schedule, uh, then, at, so that was Saturday, December 16th. And then on Wednesday, December 20th. So just a few days later is the jump man invitational. The second year of that, there are four teams in it, Carolina, along with Michigan and Oklahoma and Florida. This takes place in Charlotte at the Hornets arena. Carolina this year plays Oklahoma time and TV to be announced. Remember Carolina played Michigan last year, meaning that next year in the third iteration of this event, the Tar Heels will take on the chomp chomp Florida Gators. And then wrapping up the non-conference portion of the schedule, Carolina returns home for one more buy game. And that will be against Charleston Southern time and TV to be announced. That is on Friday, December 29th. So that'll close out 2023. Um, first ever meeting between Carolina and Charleston Southern. I can say that one uh, with certitude. So uh, the first time Carolina will play Charleston Southern and UC Riverside. As a reminder, in terms of the ACC portion of the schedule, that is not out yet. We know who Carolina will play in their 20 games, who they will play home only, away only, and both. But we just don't know the order or dates or times or anything like that. That schedule will come out in totality in September. So just in case you were wondering, Carolina plays at home only Louisville, Notre Dame, Virginia Tech, and Wake Forest. On the road only Boston College, Georgia Tech, Pitt, and Virginia. Seems like that happens a lot. 
And then the teams that Carolina plays home and away, always Duke, always NC State. Each team has two other partners that they play home and away every year. It's it's the Blue Devils and the Wolfpack for Carolina. And then the other four that are both home and away are Clemson, Florida State, Miami, and Syracuse. So Carolina has to go to the extremes, all the way up to Syracuse, all the way down to both Florida schools. So uh, interesting schedule there. We'll unpack that more when the ACC schedule is revealed in full. But then we also know that the ACC tournament will be March 12th through 16th. And this year it's in the nation's capital up in D.C. So there you go. There's the 11 games of the non-conference portion of the schedule. I want to give you some takeaways on it beyond some of the cursory stuff that I've already said. Uh, Really, really interesting the way that non-conference schedules are made up in this day and age. And we'll talk about why that is and what it looks like and what you should be expecting out of the non-conference portion of the schedule, including my prediction for Carolina's record in those 11 games. All that coming up in just a second. But before we get there, I need to tell you that this episode of Locked on Tar Heels is brought to you by FanDuel. Hey, listen, football season is about to kick off and FanDuel is giving you the chance to win all season long. Because right now when you bet on a Super Bowl winner, yeah, go ahead and bet on a Super Bowl winner, you can get bonus bets every time they win a game in the regular season. Just pick any team to win the Super Bowl and legitimately you'll get bonus bets every victory they rack up. So I'm going with the Chiefs because they're real good at stuff. And they live like, and they play like two hours north of me. So you can use these bonus bets on spreads, player props, over-unders, and much more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and start earning bonus bets with America's number one sports book. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. All right. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in to Locked on Tar Heels. Great to be with you today. You everydayers, welcome in. Always so glad that you're here. If you're a guest, first time or whatever it is, awesome. Welcome in. We're glad you're here. We'd love to know your thoughts on the non-conference portion of the schedule. Next uh, week, next Friday, we're going to have a mailbag episode. Go ahead and get your questions in, lockedontarheels at gmail.com. You can even send a video, 10 to 15 seconds, your name, where you're from, and your question. And you might just see yourself or hear yourself on the show. All right. So my takeaways with the non-conference portion of the schedule and a prediction for the wins and losses. Here's the takeaways. Uh, I mentioned that Carolina has their exhibition game publicized, not the uh, secret scrimmage yet. And also we do not know the details for live action with HD. Remember, it's not called late night with Hubert, like it was called Late Night with Roy, they call it live action based on Coach Davis's kind of now infamous live action out there saying that he made up. That'll be before that exhibition game, though, which again was on October 27th. So you can expect that in uh, in mid-October at some point in that era. Um, here's the biggest takeaway for me from this non-conference schedule. Carolina plays exactly zero true road games in these 11 games. I went back and looked and I could not like all the way back to 1998, 99. And then I was just getting tired of looking Carolina every year back at least that far has played at least one true road game in the non-conference portion of the schedule. I'm sure it goes farther back than that. I'm going to keep looking and I'm actually probably just going to reach out to Steve Kirshner, Carolina's great sports information director, because I'm sure he's got the answer when the last time that happened was, but that kind of boggled my mind, but it's part of what the deal is now. We've only got 11 non-conference games because you get 31 regular season games. The ACC has 20 conference games. Carolina has six neutral site games. You've got the three games in Atlantis. You've got the Jumpman Invitational. You've got the CBS Sports Classic and the Jimmy V Classic. And then you do have the ACC SEC Challenge, but Carolina's at home. And so you've got that game and then four other bye games. So you've got five true home games and six neutral games. And that there you go. That's your non-conference schedule. So Carolina's only will only have 10 true road games and that'll all be ACC. Pretty crazy, huh? Yeah, but that's where we're at. Now, here's another issue that you have with having 20 conference games and so many of these multi-team events. 
there's just not much time, not much wiggle room to get yourselves figured out. When you only had 16 conference games, for example, <clears throat> when there were nine ACC schools and you played true round robin, every everyone home and away. And I mean, that's four more non-conference games. And I know that might not seem like much, but it really is when Carolina right now only has four quote unquote buy games, you could literally double those. And that gives you so much more time to work on getting new guys in, figuring out rotations, figuring out what clusters of players work well together and don't maybe things that you didn't expect before they got on the court. So as you look at the non-conference portion of the schedule, you got those three buy games and the exhibition right off the top. And then you have that one non-conference uh, buy game at home at the end of the non-conference portion of the schedule. So Carolina has to take great advantage of those opportunities. So you've got those four off the top, the exhibition game, and then whatever order it was of Radford, Lehigh, and UC Riverside. It might even be that order. That's where Carolina, where Coach Davis and the coaching staff have to take advantage of those games. And the, listen, here's the other thing. Those aren't chump teams. Those first three games uh, Radford, Lehigh, and UC Riverside all finished, interestingly enough, third in their conferences last season. So none of those are throwaway mid-major games. Carolina's got to come to play. But Coach Davis has got to try things there. I remember all the time folks were getting fed up with Coach Williams because Carolina would take some lumps in the non-conference schedule. But that's what you got to do. I, I will trade a couple non-conference losses for figuring out your roster testing the depth to see what you got so that you're ready for ACC play so that you're ready for conference tournament play and hopefully the NCAA tournament. But the problem is when you have these high leverage games right out of the gate, you need to win them so that they're not dings on your resume. So it's kind of this catch 22 that, that we're in because of what schedules look like in this day and age. So I, I want to see Carolina take some lumps, not against those buy games, um, but but against maybe some of those other neutral site games. So we'll see. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that the ACC, ever since the ACC network started, remember that was the year Carolina opened up with Notre Dame at home. That was Cole Anthony's season and went off in that game. Ever since then, the ACC has been sprinkling in uh, one to two conference games during the non-conference part of the schedule. In fact, prior to the new year. And so I would expect to see that when the conference schedule is released, you know, you got a couple windows there where that might happen. Um, you've got those 11 days in there where Carolina has their um, finals break that they always take, but 11 days long, you probably don't need all that. So that's kind of where I would expect to see a game or two tossed in maybe. Um, and there maybe another spot would be between the Jumpman Invitational and Charleston Southern. That's a nine day gap. So that those are the two spaces that I'm anticipating that the ACC will load in some uh, probably two conference games like they did last year. A couple other things. There are seven non buy games. So 11 total, four of them are what we call buy games where you basically pay a team to come play you and whip their butt and figure out what you're doing. Of those seven that are not by games, the neutral site games other than hosting Tennessee at home, five of those seven games are probably going to be against ranked teams. Um, now, some of that is dependent on who the second and third opponent in Atlantis are. But I'm, you know, if things play out and everyone wins in the way you expect them to, those second and third games would be Villanova and Arkansas, who, um, Villanova is going to be a lot better than they were last year. I expect them to be in the 15 to 20 range. Arkansas is a top 15 team. They're old, just like the Tar Heels are. Tennessee should be a top 10 team, maybe top 15. It depends on how quickly Zakai Ziegler gets back. UConn has reloaded and kept a bunch of guys, so they should be top 10. And then Kentucky, it remains to be seen, I think, with some of the transfer pieces they've been able to get late are going to be on a good footing. I would have them in the 15 to 20 range as well. But assuming Carolina plays Villanova and Arkansas in Atlantis, you're going to have five games against ranked opponents in, in those 11 games of the non-conference portion of the schedule. So just be ready for that. Um, 
here's another thing that I like about this that I didn't like about last year. Remember how just, I've talked about this multiple times, so you might have heard me say it, but do you remember how insane it was, Carolina's schedule? They went up to Portland, they had that four overtime game against um, against Alabama on a Sunday night, and then from there, they were playing um, in Bloomington against Indiana in the ACC Big Ten Challenge on Wednesday. So didn't even come back to Chapel Hill. It just went straight from Portland to Bloomington. That was a brutal portion of the schedule, made worse because Carolina lost to Iowa State, and then lost to Alabama, and then just basically had nothing left in the tank against Indiana before coming home. This year's version of that is pretty similar, but, but the travel schedule is so much better. Instead of going to Portland, Carolina is going to Atlantis, which is still, you know, a flight, but it's not nearly, nearly as bad as going to Portland and a much more similar time zone situation. Right. Um, and so you've got that. And then it's the same kind of thing. It's like where the ACC Big Ten Challenge was right after that. That's where the ACC SEC Challenge comes is right after Atlantis. But instead of going to Knoxville, the volunteers are coming to Chapel Hill. So it's a shorter flight for the multi-team event. Same time zone or similar. I think Bahamas is in the uh, Eastern time zone. Let me look it up in real time because that'll be interesting. What time is it in Nassau, Bahamas? Um, no, they are one hour. Ahead. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're one hour ahead of me. I'm in Central. So that's great. So same time zone for the Bahamas. But then North Carolina gets to go home instead of to Knoxville. So much, much better situation there put the Tar Heels on a better footing, but you still got to take care of those games. Cause again, Tennessee is going to be very tough, always tough defensively. You know how that goes. So these 11 games, I'm predicting that Carolina, I think they should easily win the four by game. So let's call that four and O. Oh. And then you look at the other seven Carolina's got to get some revenge against Northern Iowa. I, I think I'm going to say two and one in Atlanta just because Carolina has never won that. I really, really want and need them to because they got to make a statement. But in a tournament like that with all those teams, with Carolina trying to still figure out who they are, I'm going to say two and one down there. And then uh, between the other games with um, Tennessee, UConn, Kentucky, and Oklahoma, I'm going to say Carolina goes three and one in those games. And listen, that that is... That's tough. Uh, I I think Oklahoma they should take care of in the Jumpman Invitational, but to go two and one against Tennessee, UConn, and Kentucky, I'll take that. I wouldn't be shocked if the Tar Heels went one and two in that stretch. But I'm gonna I'm gonna be optimist here and say two and one in that stretch, meaning nine and two overall in the non-conference schedule. You're probably lower than me on that. Like if I was setting the over under and asking people to predict it, I would say over under eight and a half wins in the non-conference. I'm curious what you would go with. Again, I'm going with nine and two. Oh man, it's so fun to talk schedule stuff. I hope you're as jazzed about it. I just said jazzed. Yep, that happened as I am. Now, the biggest non-basketball story of the week, Devon Des Walker and the NCAA. I cannot figure out this organization ever. They are the worst. Hashtag free Tez. We're going to talk about that more in just a second as well. But before we get to that, I need to tell you that today's episode of Locked on Tar Heels is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Hey, let's not beat around the bush here. Bird Dog shorts and pants make you look and feel great. I just got my first pair of pants recently, and they're legitimately insanely comfortable. It's been like upper 90s here in Missouri, but I was wearing them around the house the other day because they're so comfortable and keep me cool, even in the dead of summer. Bird Dogs also have these stretch khaki shorts that are designed to fit slimmer and, um, and in the thigh and the leg, giving you a truly sculpted look. They fit way better than regular shorts that are made of that stiff, restricting cotton. How do they do that? Well... They fix the issue by inventing what they call cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki, but stretches to give you a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. Bird Dogs also uses anti-stink sweat wicking fabric that keeps you cool and dry all day long. So go to birddogs.com slash locked on college or enter promo code locked on college for a free white Bird Dogs tech hat with your order. 
Again, that's birddogs.com slash locked on college or promo code locked on college for a free white bird dogs tech cat. You're not going to want to take off your bird dogs. We promise you that. All right, folks, I'm assuming that you've heard of this because it is everywhere on social media. Everybody's talking about it. You probably heard about it at the water cooler on, on Tuesday or Wednesday, but here's what's happening. Devontae Walker, preseason first team, all ACC wide receiver. Monday was named to the preseason Bolitnikoff award watch list, which is the award given to the best wide receiver in the nation. Transfer from Kent State, played two years there. Everything seemed good. And then we learned on Tuesday that the NCAA was denying his waiver. Why? Well, because he had initially gone to ETSU, suffered a preseason injury, didn't even play, and transferred to NC Central in 2020. They canceled their season because COVID. So then he went to Kent State, played two years, and then decided to transfer home to the state of North Carolina to play for the Tar Heels. Did that um, back after last season. Here's the problem. The NCAA is apparently cracking down on players who are transferring a second time. I, I do not understand this institution. So here's what the NCAA said to ESPN's Andrea Adelson on Wednesday. They said this, on January 11th, the Division I Council, which includes a voting rep from each D1 conference, voted unanimously to significantly tighten the criteria for undergraduate students who transfer for a second time to be granted a waiver to play immediately. As a result of this vote, multiple time transfers who cannot demonstrate and adequately document a personal need for medical or safety reason to depart the previous school are not eligible to compete immediately following their second undergraduate transfer. As a result of the D1 Council vote, national office staff at the direction of the NCAA members have begun applying those criteria for multiple time transfers for the 2023-24 academic year. Okay, there is so much here that is just wrong. Yes, Devontae Walker has been at other schools, but at ETSU, he was graciered and not even registered, meaning he's like not on the roster. So yes, he was there, went through, you know, workouts, whatever. And then NC Central didn't have a season. So he goes to Kent State. To me, that should be considered his first school because of, because of all those mitigating circumstances. But even if you considered that, that it was not like if you call one of those a transfer and say that it is his second transfer to Carolina, here's the thing. The coaching staff at Kent State left. And when that happens, just like what happened with West Virginia, players were given free reign to go transfer because of not being able to play for the coaching staff that they went for. Moreover, Devontae Walker comes home to be near his sick grandma who... um you know, like it, that's a thing that the, that the NCAA grants all the time. Like Dawson Garcia transferred from Marquette to North Carolina and then to go be with his sick family, transferred a second time to go back home. Now I know that was before they instituted this rule, but, but it's the same kind of thing, transferring home to go be near sick family. And this is what the NCAA hands that out like candy. Now, now I get they're doing a different thing now, but even still, Devontae Walker transferred, like committed, before this new timeline was put into place. But the NCAA says they don't care. They followed up with Andrea Adelson later and said this. Even though Jackson, who's a player at Florida State going through the same thing, and Walker made their decisions and were enrolled before January 11th, I have been told the NCAA staff has not been asked to give special consideration to the timing of a transfer decision and whether it occurred before or after the council vote. What? That makes zero sense. So I've decided to transfer under a set of rules that at the time of my transfer, I'm doing what these rules allow. But because of something that you did after I transferred, you're, you're expecting me to to be under those transfer guidelines, that doesn't work. 
there, there, there is legal fallacy all over that. Unless I'm just missing something, you know what I like? If you do anything here, here's the rules. Here's the guidelines that I'm working under. Great. I'm going to abide by those. Let's say there is a, uh, a yield sign that I, that I treat as a yield sign instead of a stop sign, you know, and I don't come to a complete stop and I roll on through and two days from now, the uh, Department of Transportation goes and switches that yield sign out for a stop sign. And they have me on camera rolling through the yield sign. And I get a ticket because now there's a stop sign there and I didn't stop. Well, I, I obeyed the law that was in place when I went through that, that intersection. You can't be expecting me to abide by a rule that I don't even know exists. How is that any different than this? I just do not. There's so much to unpack with this. I love how many people are getting in on it. You know, there's uh, like Jay Billis was talking about it. Governor Cooper is sending messages to the NCAA. Um, I mean, all, all of this stuff. Pete Thamel is all over. People are talking about it all over the nation, how um, wrong this whole thing is. And so the, just I, I am flabbergasted by this whole situation. Other Tar Heel football players are speaking out. JJ, Ro JJ Jones, Cayman Rucker, Armando Baycott's tweeting about it. Like, it is wild. Here's another thing. Coaches can go anywhere at any point and any time they want to. So shouldn't student-athletes be allowed to either do the same or when a coach decides to do that, transfer without penalty? I just, I, I, I can't. And meanwhile, there's, there's quarterbacks that are like 57 years old on their eighth school and they're playing and they're like, no, nah. there is nothing the NCAA could say to me that that would make this make sense. Now, if somebody out there can make sense of this and can rationally explain to me why this is correct and accurate, I would love to sit down and have a conversation and I will listen. But right now, I don't see it. Anyway, I got to I got I got to stop. Time is up. We got to end the show today before I just get going too much. It's not often I get fired up like this, but this is infuriating to me. And I'm sure it is for you too. That's it for today's episode of Locked On Tar Heels. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, great to talk about the schedule stuff. Frustrating to talk about the Devontae Walker stuff. Hopefully that will get uh, situated sooner rather than later. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked On Heels. Follow me at Isaac Shade. Don't forget to email the show, Locked On Tar Heels at gmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe on audio or video platforms. Smash the like button to let us know you are here. Folks, it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. We'll talk again tomorrow to wrap up the week. But until then, peace. <laughs>